This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. This is my iron. You're going to acknowledge me. And welcome to the WWE Podcast, everyone. It is Friday, February 23rd, 2024. And we're going to be doing a couple of things today with finishing up the mailbag and the preview and prediction show for Elimination Chamber, which comes to us tomorrow morning, very early tomorrow morning for most of us. So uh, if you're up, and you're watching, God bless you. I won't be. Uh, it's 5 a.m. I mean, sometimes my kids wake me up a little bit earlier and I might be able to, but the problem is in the morning. I mean, kids are crazy. You can't just, you know, turn on the TV and tell them to shut up at, at a young age. It's not going to work. Um, so I just, I'm telling you that not just to uh, give you insights into my personal life that you don't care about, but also uh, I want to let you know, I don't know if I'll be tweeting as it's quote unquote live because most of us may or may not be. I know that uh, the, those of us or those of you who are listeners over in the UK are celebrating. I think I can hear you across the pond cheering that you finally have a pay-per-view or a PLE that's at a reasonable hour. But the rest of us crybabies, pun intended, are going to be uh, you know, very upset that we don't get to watch it live or that we have to stay up super late or get up super early to watch it. Either way, um, I won't be probably watching it live. I'll try to watch it as, as best I can throughout the day. And uh, tomorrow night, I'm also going to be partaking in uh, some some after hours activity, uh, if you know what I mean. Um, well, actually, I probably should tell you. Otherwise, it's very suggestive. <laughs> I'll be having a few drinks tomorrow night. So I don't know if uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get a review up super quick. It's going to be weird. I, I'll probably more likely get it up Sunday, but we'll see. You know, I have a hotel room. We'll see. Maybe I'll be able to get something up while I'm inebriated and then immediately get kicked off the platform for uh for a you know an R-rated show. All right. Uh, that said, let's get to the preview and prediction show. And then on the second half, we're going to do the mailbag, the second half of it. And I'm going to promise you as best I can that I'm going to get through as many as I can. More have come in since Wednesday. So this may be just as a warning, guys, or rather more of as a disclaimer. As the volume grows here on the show for the mailbag, I have every single show to the best of my ability not without, I'm not perfect. I've missed emails and voicemails before, but up till this point, I have been able to get to everyone's or make an effort to get to everyone's email and voicemail. I don't know if moving forward, I'm going to be able to make, keep that promise because the volume is getting so big and so, or so, um, so high, right? So I'm going to make my best effort to, but if, you know, push comes to shove and I, I just don't have time to do it, I apologize. I mean, I appreciate everybody sending in their emails, but kind of one of the drawbacks of a show growing is that, you know, we can't get to every single person, uh, but I'll try up until, I mean, I'm getting close to the breaking point of being able to manage this uh, in terms of just, you know, getting everybody on the show, but all right, so let's get to it. Let's talk about Elimination Chamber that comes to us tomorrow night from, or tomorrow morning for most of us from Perth, Australia, and the main event of the show, by the way, I believe is Rhea Ripley and Nia Jax. I believe that's actually the main event, and it should be. Think about this, though. Not just excited. I mean, we're all excited for Rhea Ripley. The crowd reaction is going to be thunderous, as Michael Cole would say. It's going to be, and it's going to be so much fun to hear how what the chants are and the mommy chants. And I mean, it's going to be boo, yay, boo, yay. It's going to be electric for Rhea Ripley. But how about Nia Jax? coming from complete obscurity and no one wanting her back to making it to the main event of a PLE. So I got to give her credit. I still don't really like her, but I can recognize her improvements and give her credit for making it to the main event of a PLE. She has made strides and good for her. So I'm excited for Nia Jax too. I know she's kind of the really just a the, the, the side story or not even a side story. She's just the, the body filling the main event to uh, oppose Rhea Ripley. But we got to remember Nia Jax too here. And the fact that there'll be a moments in this match that I think will make us believe that, my God, couldn't I actually do it? And that's what you look for in these kinds of matches that are so heavily favored for one person or the other. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But I wanted to point that out up front. Now, 
Let's talk. There's not many matches on the sh- on the card. That's been the Triple H, I don't know, fingerprint, if you will, over the last several months is him having really a trend over the really over a year or two is fewer matches, longer matches. And I think I actually enjoy that instead of just having it rapid fire. You give the storylines that are deserving of a PLE platform time to breathe and have the wrestlers allow them more than enough time to tell their story. And I appreciate that. And I'm sure the the, uh, wrestlers who get the matches actually do, too. So let's go through it. The women's elimination chamber match, which if this doesn't open the show, I will be floored. This has to open the show as it usually does. And that is Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, Liv Morgan, Naomi, Tiffany Stratton, and Raquel Rodriguez. So what happens? Well, there there is an overwhelming sense of Becky Lynch winning. Overwhelming. Because they have WWE is essentially built to Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch before it was even possible that she would win the chamber to get into the main event to face Rhea Ripley. So they've been building this before a match even existed for Becky to challenge Rhea. And then Rhea Ripley and Becky had their stare off at the press conference in Vegas a few weeks ago. And that is more than a foreshadowing. That's just kind of like, hey, we're, we're doing this. It's a formality for, for Becky Lynch to go through the chamber. And do I think Becky Lynch is going to win? Yes, I still do. But they could throw a curveball. And here's the curveball. Bianca Belair. Bianca Belair could be the curveball that we've been looking for if you're looking for one. And that is Bianca Belair versus Rhea Ripley. That, I think, would actually pose more of a crowd challenge, meaning opposing chance than Becky and Rhea. And I know Becky, the, the supporters out there that are listening, um, I understand you, you're, you, you love Becky. I understand that you have a connection with her and she's deserving and it's been two years. But we've also, at the same time, seen a long, many, many title reigns from Becky Lynch that have been lengthy. And we have not seen that from Rhea Ripley yet. I mean, she's, she's been champion for my God, 10 months now. So great, but it hasn't felt like they focused on her championship up until the last six months. So Rhea Ripley is also catching fire. She's already on fire and that momentum is just starting to build. So at the same time though, Bianca Belair is I think on a bit of a uh I don't know if redemption to to pull a word from Liv Morgan is the right word more of a re-energ- re-energization of her career because she's been kind of in the background a little bit uh she hasn't been the forefront of everything and Bianca Belair and actually I believe Bianca Belair and Rhea Ripley could have a better match than Becky and Rhea they're better suited from a physical standpoint they're uh, Becky Lynch is not as strong as Rhea which poses its challenges right when when you when you uh, have two muscular women in there there's more they can do but Becky Lynch poses maybe a little more speed either way we also haven't seen Bianca Belair and Rhea Ripley yet on the main card anyway or on the main roster anyway I think we've seen it in NXT we saw a little bit of it a few years ago at the Rumble when they were the two last women in the Rumble I think it was 2021 was it 21 somebody will correct me out there but Bianca Belair and Rhea Ripley were the final two and they put on a clinic to end that match that, of course, ended with Rhea Ripley winning. But we never got an official program with Rhea and, and uh, Bianca yet. And last year, the Raw after WrestleMania, the very underwhelming one, one thing I do remember, and it may be the only thing I remember from that show, which is sad, but is Bianca Belair and Rhea Ripley both holding their respective women's championships, having an interaction and foreshadowing perhaps this year's WrestleMania. Now, were they thinking that all the way back then? Maybe, but a lot has changed since then. Vince has gone. Creative has been, you know, shuffled up. Triple H is now truly ahead of creative. There's been a lot of changes at the board. And uh, I mean, right. So who knows? But we still haven't got it. And it could be the time to pull the trigger. So that's your case for Bianca Belair to win this. Everyone else, there's no chance. None. Sorry, Liv. Not happening. Naomi, um, she's kind of your third potential pick, I think. She's returning. It's fun to see her back, but she doesn't have a, a significant chance. Raquel Rodriguez, I'd put at number four um, as possible. Liv Morgan's five, and then Tiffany Stratton's six. But Raquel has no 
real momentum coming back. We all feel bad for her with her, you know, her, uh, what is it? Some, I can't remember the disease that she's been diagnosed with. I feel bad for her. And I, re- I saw a video of her crying and it is emotional and, and, you know, all the things she's had to deal with, with her skin and, and, and I feel for her. But as a character on TV, if you take that out of it, she's not an interesting character. She belongs to, to be a heel. She's a strong woman. Yes, but there's no character development behind her. It's not happening. And as far as Tiffany Stratton goes, she is the least likely, although I think she'll have a good showing. She's not going to get squashed. Tiffany Stratton, I think, is going to be uh, not eliminated first. I think Liv Morgan might be eliminated first. Uh, and then Tiffany Stratton maybe second. But Tiffany Stratton is just starting to get her foot in the door on the main roster. And she feels like she belongs. Don't get me wrong. She feels like a significant character. Her moonsault is beautiful. Her character feels authentic, although it is a bit uh, um, it is a bit Chelsea Greenish, you know, so Tiffany, though, is just getting going. It would be ridiculous to put her in the main event of WrestleMania. Anyway, I don't mind her earning a shot at a B level pay-per-view at this point, but not at a WrestleMania 40, for God's sakes. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't lose my mind. I would just be like, wow, that's a ballsy move. You know, honestly, none, none of these would make me angry. But I would be really raising an eyebrow or two at some of these picks. Uh, but if you're looking for the top two, for me, it's Lynch. And then a close second is Bianca Belair, who poses a real threat here and one to keep an eye on. One to keep an eye on. So Becky Lynch probably does win. Sure, it's predictable. And up and down the card, it looks predictable, which scares me. Anytime you have a card that looks super predictable, there's usually one out there that floats that's floating out there that gives you a shock. I don't know if this will be that one. I think they may just continue with the build that they've been going with of Becky versus Rhea. And by the way, I expect a physical match, fun match, and uh, could, could uh, rival the men's in terms of quality, but the men's is just stacked. And we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, next up is the Undisputed Tag Team Championship, the Judgment Day versus Pete Dunn and Tyler Bate. You know, this one, I still think the Judgment Day is going to win. It's kind of weird that Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate are getting the 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 spotlight here, given that DIY have been, I know that they didn't win, but they've been getting a pretty good push and the crowds have been behind him. Also, where the hell are the Creed brothers that, that put on a wrestling clinic week after week in the tag team division? Where are they? You know, I understand that Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate earned it. I get it. And they're trying to give them a platform to get at least just recognition with the fans. Uh, I mean, we all know Pete Dunn, right? Uh, Butch. But still, uh, as he's being repackaged with Tyler Bate, it is uh, it is still a new tag team to the main roster anyway and to the mainstream fan. So fine. They'll have a really good match. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, they'll probably cheat to win. The Judgment Day will cheat to win. Probably Dom will get involved. Uh, and... Uh, Damian Priest and Finn Balor retain because I believe our truth and Miz, who I think may have something to say in this match, will also show their faces. And uh, I don't think they'll cost Judgment Day, but come close to it or attack them after the match and uh, for a big pop from the crowd. All right. The men's. And I'm, by the way, I'm giving you guys the order of the matches that I think are actually going to happen. So as I give you the predictions. So the men's. Now, typically, the men's Elimination Chamber match would be the main event of the show. But given Rhea Ripley, it is, I don't think it's going to happen. I think it even was officially made uh, official um, with Triple H on X earlier that it was going to be Rhea Ripley who is main eventing with Nia Jax. So that's cool. But the men's, I think, will go on third. And Drew McIntyre, Randy Orton, Bobby Lashley, LA Knight, Kevin Owens, and Logan Paul with a... World Championship opportunity awaiting the winner against Seth Rollins at WrestleMania 40. Okay. So, wow. Stacked. 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 I mean, especially not not even just star power, which is pretty high in this match, but also ability, youth, in, in, in some respects, in this match uh, when it comes to at least Logan Paul. Everyone else is not exactly a spring chicken. Uh, so maybe youth isn't the right word, but athletic ability. Let's do that. Okay. Now, Drew McIntyre is, the, I think, a heavy favorite. I don't think it's as overwhelming as the Becky Lynch favorite in the women's uh, match, but 
Drew McIntyre is a heavy favorite to win this match. I think when you look beyond Drew McIntyre, Orton is somebody that has really inexplicably been kind of forgotten. I mean, how the hell do we forget about Randy Orton? Ever since he made his return at Survivor Series and then his return was stomped on by CM Punk, which it was. I know it wasn't the return directly after Orton returned, meaning it like Orton returned and then five seconds later Punk returned. But it was close enough to Randy Orton's return. And it was at the same event that people forgot about Orton and started talking about Punk. And ever since then, Randy Orton was supposed to go into a program with Roman. We all I was excited for a one on one. There's a big story there dating back 18 months. They didn't go that way. They went with a multi-person fatal four way, which I still don't believe was the right call. I know they didn't want Orton to lose, but I wouldn't have cared. And I don't think people would have looked differently at Orton if he lost. So we never got the one on one with Roman, which, again, is annoying. But Orton has been kind of a, dare I say, dark horse in this match where, yeah, I mean, people look at him as a big star, but I think most people look at him as, yeah, he'll hang around to the last few. Maybe even it'll come down to Drew and Orton. And then it'll be, uh, you know, McIntyre getting the Claymore at Orton in some kind of, uh, you know, questionable way, which is probably the outcome. But Orton is a very believable guy to face Seth Rollins. There's a history with Seth and uh, and, uh, and and Randy Orton. Think back to what was it? WrestleMania 31? What it was. Remember that? Was, was that what it was? I think it was WrestleMania 31. When Rollins cashed in that night, but he lost to Orton early in the night with the crazy RKO that from went from a curb stomp at the time it was called to an RKO. And I remember it being super sunny outside. I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> I don't like when it's sunny. I, I don't like that. But that's what I remember. And so they faced each other at WrestleMania before. It's been nine years, but they, they've done it. And there's a story there. The problem is, though, that you have baby face, baby face. That's a problem. Bobby Lashley has no chance. He probably has uh, as equal chance as Logan Paul does with Logan Paul already being the U.S. champion. Ain't going to happen. There's no chance of those two. Kevin Owens is in like fourth place, maybe. Yeah, I'd I'd say he's fourth place for winning. I think he's destined for a Logan Paul, L.A. Knight, U.S. title fatal or um, a triple threat at WrestleMania for the U.S. title, probably. Um, But L.A. Knight is probably a third choice. LA Knight is probably going to make some noise in this, get a little get an elimination, maybe two and hit a BFT. But ultimately, he will lose. I think LA Knight probably doesn't have a significant chance either, which, again, leaves you with Drew and Orton. That's it. The rest of these guys don't make a bunch of sense. LA Knight is the closest you could make of an argument. I mean, if they put LA Knight and Seth Rollins together, that'd be (laughs) I wouldn't hate it. But also. All these guys except one is a SmackDown guy. So unless somebody's going to come over to Raw, which they're not going to do, I don't think, officially, anyway. Drew also makes sense from just a brand standpoint. So Drew, I think, is a very heavy favorite to win this. He should win it, honestly, because he has had so much character growth in a short amount of time, giving us a heel version of himself we've never seen giving us a different kind of heel too, where that person believes, as I've said, is the hero in their own story, that they feel they can't do anything wrong. It's not that he knows he's doing something dastardly. He thinks he's always justified in it. It's a great just tweak on a, a typical a typical heel's psychology, and, and I'm loving it. So Drew McIntyre should win this match. I don't care how he wins it. I don't care if it's a low blow. I don't care if it's happenstance. I don't care if someone interferes. Drew should win this and face Seth Rollins for the the uh, world title because that is the right story to, to to tell right now, and that is a you know I think the right way to 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 book this. Now, does Seth Rollins interfere in this match? No, he already has his segment with the Grayson Waller effect. We'll get to that in a minute. So, I think you have a a, a very physical. Cra- I mean, think about the things Logan Paul is going to do in this match. Logan Paul, I mean, they should have the EMTs ready, like on standby at the entrance, ready to rush down because this is going to be dangerous, I think, at times uh, with with how physical that that steel 
Cage is, there needs to be somebody ready. I mean, Logan Paul, not that he's un- unsafe, but the dude kills himself in a normal match. What the hell is he going to do in a, you know, a, a match with a, a chamber, for God's sakes? So, I mean, this is going to hurt a lot for Logan Paul, but he's going to make a name for himself as he continues to. Uh, I still expect a lot, a pretty good match here. I, I mean, really good. Logan Paul is the X factor here when it comes to crazy crap that he could do and, and probably will do. Um, but Drew McIntyre is going to win. I think it's, if I'm going to guess, it's probably going to come down to Drew McIntyre and maybe LA Knight. I think Orton will get eliminated second to last or third to last, maybe by, uh, you know, uh, maybe by Orton or maybe by Drew rather. But I think LA Knight and Drew would be a fun ending instead of Orton and Drew, but they may go with just a bigger star in Orton and Drew, which, hey, I have no problem with this. So uh, this is going to be so much fun. Now, let's get to the Grayson Waller effect with Seth and with Cody. So Seth and Cody on the Grayson Waller effect. You know that Grayson Waller is going to get his ass kicked. Maybe Austin Theory will show up there. Austin Theory uh, may come to the aid or already be in the ring, and these two you know, may battle as Seth is. I know he's he's getting close to being cleared, so he might be able to do some physicality in the ring, brawl with Grayson Waller and Austin Theory, who may be there. But also, after they beat them down, I could see Roman Reigns coming in and spearing both guys standing there tall. I don't think you're going to see The Rock. I think Triple H even confirmed that The Rock, while well, he has, uh, he said, many other tv dates this isn't one of them in perth so i don't expect to see the rock if he shows up it'll be a shock and i wouldn't hate it but i do believe roman reigns after grayson waller and austin theory get their ass kicked by seth and cody are going to come in he's, he's going to come in hit the spear on both of them to deafening booze from perth and i think that's the way it should go get some more heat on roman and build to an eventual tag team match with seth and cody versus rock and roman Wherever or however that match takes place, I have no clue. I know people are going with, well, it's WrestleMania 40. Roman's going to do double duty, you know, main event both nights. There's good and bad to that. We'll see how that pans out. But uh, this is clearly a build to that. So Seth and Roman, by the way, haven't had any physicality in about two years, two plus years. So that's how I think it's going to go down. Now let's get to the Women's World Championship, the main event, Rhea Ripley versus Nia Jax. And crowd reaction, crowd reaction, crowd reaction is what to listen for here. As uh, Rhea Ripley, with 40,000 people behind her, is going to be the hero of the uh, you know, of the decade over there in Perth. And she should be. The, the crowd is going to give, I'm sure Rhea, Rhea will never forget this moment. Let me just say that. Because Rhea has not been, I don't think she's been, wrestled in australia before as a wwe wrestler i don't think she has but i'll have to check on that either way this to me if i'm rhea ripley looking at this from a human perspective i'm thinking to myself man you know uh this is this is a special moment i know that she didn't grow up in perth she actually grew up like five hours away from perth okay her hometown is not near perth but it's still the home country so for her being in her home country and being the women's world champion and she's already got momentum behind her anyway in the United States. Think about the reaction for Rhea in Perth. It's going to be crazy. And I am excited for her. It's a moment in her life. She will never forget. Um, but storyline wise, there is a zero. Let me just reemphasize zero percent chance of Nia Jax winning. I, you know, I, I, if, if Nia Jax wins, look out. It would make the reaction for The Undertaker losing at WrestleMania pale in comparison. <laughs> it just, I mean, I would actually be scared for the safety of the wrestlers, right? Like, you know, but there's no chance they're going to do that. Does the cynical part of me want to see what 40,000 people who came to watch Rio and Rio win the match do if Rio loses? Yes. There's a dark side of me that I would love to see that reality and have Rio just, I mean, just come in and squash her. Imagine. Rhea just comes in. She gets like maybe a couple punches in. Nia Jax does, you know, her bowling ball in the corner or or, uh, not a bowling ball, but like a her squash in the corner does a couple of those hits her hits her uh, annihilator a couple times. One, two, three new women's world champion. (laughs) I mean, it's it's not going to happen. That'd be that would just be that'd be a bad piece of business for 
just all the way around. Other than just shock value, it's a bad decision. So I expect 12-minute match, maybe 15 minutes, slow-paced, high-power maneuvers. This is not going to be a Becky Lynch, Sasha Banks classic, right? I mean, these women, Rhea Ripley's uh, powerhouse. Nia Jax is a heavier woman that, I mean, you, you know her limitations, but that's fine. I don't need a million miles an hour in my match, and I think this is going to be a very well-told story from start to finish with the crowd getting heavily involved, ultimately riptide if she can get Nia up. One, two, three, we have a, a you know, not a new champion, but uh, Rhea Ripley retains the Women's World Championship and moves on to Becky Lynch at WrestleMania. That's my take. There's just no other way to do it. Now, could you have, could you have a surprise appearance from, say, Jade Cargill? I, I mean, I guess, I guess. People have been talking about that. I mean, Jade Cargill right now, outside of the Rumble, has had zero wrestling in front of WWE fans. So, I mean, I don't expect that. That would be a left field kind of unnecessary swerve. But, I mean, I guess. But uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're going to end the show feeling good with uh, with uh, Rhea Ripley standing in front of her home crowd. Crowd losing their minds for Rhea Ripley retaining. That's how I take it. And a feel good ending. So, all right, let's uh, let's now get to the rest of those emails, and I pro- I'll get through as many as I can, but I can't promise I get through them all. I mean, it's just the reality now, guys. All right, let's start with Seth, who is a patron, and Seth says, <clears throat> "New patron here. I'll try to keep it short, as I know the mailbag is getting fuller by the day. I wanted to write in to follow up what you say around Rhea Ripley's comments that she's open to fighting men if the opportunity arose." First, I share your opinion that a fully mixed arrangement in which any man can face any woman doesn't make sense. And I also agree it would change the nature of the product as social norms would limit the men from appearing to unleash the fury on a female opponent in the same way they would a man. All that being said, I wanted to get your opinion of the idea of a weight class approach if it had to happen. For example, Liv and Bobby Lashley would be completely ridiculous, but Rhea could have could believably be beat the snot out of Dom, in my opinion. Inevitably, this would still keep the main titles male only due to the size difference, but would potentially appease those for uh, going in mixed matches. Thanks for the great show, Seth. Okay, Seth. So I still fundamentally disagree. I don't care if it's done by weight, if it's done by number of hairs on their head, of men and women competing, even in a fantasy uh, sports, simulated sports environment. I think it's a horrible idea i i understand what you're saying where it's like well it's only based on weight but that only accounts for weight that doesn't account for speed or strength a woman who's 150 pounds is still not as strong as an average male who's 150 pounds i mean just on average right so like somebody who's 150 pounds is a man and they're able to bench say 250 pounds is possible and a woman who's 150 pounds I don't know if there's anyone in the world who's a 150 pound woman that can bench. Maybe there is 250 pounds. So pound for pound, so to speak, it's still not even, you know, 150 pound woman and 150 pound man are not the same. There's also just basic biological differences. I know we're getting into the weeds big time, but if you break it down, the reason that men's and women's sports are not just divided by weight, but also just by, are you a man or a woman, which is how it should be, um, is men have, higher lung capacity, which allows them to distribute oxygen into their uh, into their blood a lot faster and at a higher capacity, which means more explosion in their movements. Um, You know, men have just it's not just testosterone, which people like to just bring up. Oh, it's more testosterone. There's like, you know, men and women at a cellular level are different, you know. So if you just do it by weight, well, that, that still doesn't even the playing field, you know. Uh, I, I fundamentally reject the idea of men and women competing. I understand what you're saying that Dom and Rhea, and that's may, maybe it's possible, maybe it's not. I mean, just because Dom is doesn't look like you know uh, doesn't look like uh, who, uh, I don't know Austin Theory doesn't mean in a real fight he couldn't you know beat her up. He might, he probably could. I mean, men just have a fundamentally biological advantage. They just do. You know, like that's why they don't mix men and women in MMA. MMA is also weight class, but they still separate it by men and women. And there have been without getting, you know, too uh, 
into things, if you know what I mean, men have competed with women in MMA and it is, it turns out horrendous. It turns out awful for the women. And even though it's done by, well, it's weight men. I mean, I, I, you know, it's kind of crazy that we're even having this discussion. You know what I mean? I, I don't mean Seth that you're crazy for bringing it up, but in today's culture with all the things that everyone knows what I'm talking about that's going on, everyone all of a sudden is just denying biology for all of a sudden for, for since the, you know, the, the, the dawn of humanity, everyone's understood that men are, you know, men and women are different and that uh, there's certain biological advantages men have doesn't mean men are better, just means physically they've been built differently. And all of a sudden we're just supposed to ignore this because, well, you know, right? I mean, I, I don't mean to toe the line of politics and the hot topics today, but it's starting to bleed into wrestling. And I have been waiting for this day, Be, not waiting for it and anticipatorily, meaning like I, I'm not like, oh, I can't wait, you know, hoo, 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 I can't wait to so this happens. No, I'm, I'm dreading it, but I know I can see it coming and it's starting to, the door is starting to open slowly. And if it happens where women are competing with men, or somebody who is a man that says they're a woman, right? It, let's just say what it is. If somebody transgender comes into wrestling and WWE allows it, the whole product goes, to, I mean, it's just, it, it, it means nothing, right? Like it means, it means nothing. I mean, we're all supposed to just accept everything as it is at face value. I don't want to get into that, but I, I can see it coming. And Rhea Ripley's comments are indicative of where the culture's at. Some people anyway. And I just, I think it's a horrible idea. The system works just fine as it is. The system works. Why are we trying to... There, there's nobody out there who's an advocate, I don't think, of, oh man, wrestling sucks. It'd be so much better if men and women could compete. Why? You want to do that with the NFL? Are we, are we going to apply this to the NFL? Are we going to apply this to the um, Major League Baseball? You know what I mean? Like, okay, let's let's bring in some uh, let's bring in some of the MLB players into a, uh, a woman's softball game. Let's see how that goes. It's, it's just a, it just common sense suddenly has just gone out the window for other things, but there, uh, I, I, I'll just say this. Eventually things will probably bleed into WWE and I'm going to have to address them and it's going to be a, a hotly charged topic and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. So, so there, there's a long form answer, Seth. <laughs> All right, let's, um, let's go to, where do we go? Simon, Simon, let's go. I believe Drew McIntyre wins the chamber. Nia Jax will destroy Rhea Ripley, and I believe Becky Lynch will win her chamber. And you think Nia Jax, WrestleMania Nia destroys Becky Lynch, and then Jay Uso, my guy with the Intercontinental Championship. Well, that that's not happening as we know now. Roman tells Jay before his match, "You are out of the bloodline." Uh, well, I mean, you mean Jimmy, I think. And okay. So to set up Survivor Series, Bloodline versus Bloodline. So wait a minute, I'm, I'm a bit confused. So you're saying The Rock, Jey Uso, and Jimmy Uso. I, I actually don't know what you're saying, Simon. <laughs> I'm going to have to skip over this section because I, I don't know what you mean. I, just, I, don't, I don't, but let's keep going. I don't believe Roman is just going for Hogan's run. I believe he will beat Bruno because it feels like he will never end this run. And I'm not a Roman fan. Uh, It's a possibility that Roman holds the title indefinitely. 1474, the number of days. That is four years and two weeks that Hulk Hogan's run was. And Bruno San Martino was 2,803. Almost eight years. Uh, Let's see. So... Yeah, I mean, I still believe that if Roman goes past 40 with the title, he's going to September with the title. And I, I, I will maintain that firmly. If Roman beats Cody at Mania in some weird way or outright, which the fans would, I mean, imagine the fan reaction. But if Roman wins and retains, he's going to beat Hulk Hogan's record. This is the final hurdle. I don't want to hear about SummerSlam. I don't want to hear about WrestleMania backlash. Right? Right. I don't want to hear about payback. I don't want to hear about money in the bank. I don't want to hear about, you know, any Saudi events. If Roman wins at 40, he's going to beat Hulk Hogan's record. Case closed. So Roman Reigns, this is his really final hurdle. 
before Hulk Hogan's record. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with you, though. Uh, I'm with you. Okay, Simon. Thank you. Let's talk to Sam. Quick thought. Next time The Rock does the people's elbow, he shouldn't throw his armband into the crowd, but walk over to the apron and hand it to Roman Reigns. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Like, don't give the crowd anything. Heel Rock is so much fun. God, it's so much fun. He should. Don't give the crowd a thing. Take his elbow pad and just like throw it on the mat. Like pretend he's going to throw it in the crowd and just troll the fans. Oh, I'd love that. Yes. Love that. Thank you, Sam. All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, Simon, you, I know you have another email here uh, that you have a couple scenarios for 40 for the Rock at WrestleMania 40. You're saying the Rock could have no match, but interferes in. Uh, so Cody wins on DQ rules and Roman keeps the belt. That's possible. Another scenario is that a triple threat. So Cody has more of a chance as on a triple threat and there's no DQ. So more people can get involved in a much, much like Austin or Ken Shamrock, uh, Ken Shamrock. Oh, I guess so. I mean, I guess, uh, costing Cody the match. The third scenario, the rock faces Logan Paul for the U S title. I believe that's more likely to be Kevin Owens. I'm with you on that. I don't think the rock is going to go. I mean, honestly, let's be real. This sounds disrespectful, but it's true. The Rock is not going to demote himself to the U.S. title. It, it is a demotion. It is. Scenario four, and this is the one that's going to piss off some people the most, but The Rock versus Seth for the title and The Rock wins. Ooh. I mean, I it could, but he's not in the chamber. How does that work? Does he just appoint himself as the uh, the challenger because he's on the board of the TK of TKO? Perhaps. So you think Drew's going to win the chamber and he'll challenge Seth? I, yeah, I think so too. All right. Let's continue with Andrew. And he says, hey, WWE podcast family, Andrew from New Zealand. As we all know, there's a lot happening in the WWE to get our heads around. As I was listening to the weekend review, I had a thought as to how The Rock could turn on Reigns at WrestleMania. Not sure what you think. The bloodline comes out with Roman at the start of the match, including The Rock. After Cody starts to overpower Roman and goes for a pin, Solo distracts the ref, match carries on, and then Roman sets up for the spear. Cue the shield intro. Enter Seth and Dean Ambrose. Roman tells Solo and Jimmy to go after them. Cody gets Roman from behind, does his stupid finisher three times. (laughs) Yeah. He always has to do it three times. It's ridiculous. Uh, Anyway, and pins one, two, three, while Heyman looking on in disbelief that The Rock just standing there doing nothing to help. Solo and Jimmy come back to the ring and pull Roman out. Rock enters and congratulates Cody and tells Roman Cody was right that his grandfather would be disgusted and how unfairly he keeps winning by cheating. Let me know what you think. The Rock could still fight night one, but no no idea against two. Yeah, to me, I mean, The Rock could face Randy Orton. The Rock could face John Cena on night one if Cena wants to go that road again. It's possible. But they could also do the tag team match on night one. But as far as your, your I like the, the Shield getting involved. I don't know if Dean Ambrose has any interest in coming back to the company. I think he still has some time left on his contract with AEW. So I don't know if that's possible. Dean doesn't see, seem to have any interest in coming back. But in time, I think here's the thing. I think John Moxley, Dean Ambrose, as WWE fans know him, will eventually come back to WWE. Everyone seems to come back at some point in their lives, right? You never thought CM Punk could come back. Here we are, right? Hulk Hogan, he's back. Well, he's back in a certain sense. The Ultimate Warrior, after decades of trashing the company, eventually came back for a Hall of Fame and a Monday Night Raw speech. Bret Hart came back when you never, ever, ever, ever thought he would come back given the scenario with the Montreal Screwjob, right? They all come back. So I do believe that eventually we will see a Dean Ambrose um, return to WWE. But I'm up, here's what I'm afraid of, Andrew. I like your booking. No one's brought that up yet. I don't want this match to be overthought or overbooked. This doesn't, this this is okay. I like it given, I mean, imagine the pop for the shield. But the I just don't want it to be 80 people involved in this finish. You know, I think it would muddy Cody's victory. To me, I would ban everyone from ringside. Anyone that interferes is fired or fined anyone. But I don't think they're going to do that to allow for people to interfere and potentially cost Cody. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. 
I like it though. Andrew, that was some good thinking. That was some good thinking. Um, but I don't see right now Dean Ambrose coming back. I could be wrong, but I do believe he has time left on his contract. So, all right. So let's go to Milan. And he says, hi, Matt. If Cody beats Roman and Seth loses the World Heavyweight Championship, which I think will happen at Mania, do the belts switch brands? I could see Cody taking the universal belt to Raw. You mean the Undisputed Championship? Don't 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 be like The Rock, Milan. It's the Undisputed Championship. Uh, I know what you mean, though. And Drew beating Seth and heading to SmackDown with his world title. I've noticed a lot of SmackDown participants in the chamber, and Drew has been going to a, a, going over to SmackDown a lot lately. Maybe an early tease. Plus, who does Drew have left to feud with on Raw besides maybe Punk down the road? He's already faced Sammy, Seth, and Jay a lot. I feel there are a lot of fresh battles awaiting him on SmackDown, like Braun Breaker, Knight, Orton, and Gao. So, good, good question. Good question, Milan. They could swap brands, but it always has to be an even swap. Right? Meaning, they're not going to have somebody retain, say say Roman retained, right? Or, or rather, um, Cody wins, which most people believe he's going to. And then stay on SmackDown. Or, I'm sorry, go back to Raw because he was drafted to Raw. And then the World Heavyweight Championship doesn't come to SmackDown. Like They would always make sure one show has a championship. So if they're going to do it, they could do it and swap it. But it's got to be an even swap. Now, to me, it's the men who are drafted, not the belts. When they have the draft every year or every other year or whatever they do, they draft people. They don't draft inanimate objects, right? Like they don't draft... They don't, they don't pick in the draft. The overall draft pick is the undisputed championship, right? Like it's not the, the, the belts aren't exclusive to the brand. We may think of the brand synonymously with that belt, but the belt isn't attached to the brand. The, the person is. So that means that sure. If someone's a champion that is drafted to raw wins a championship that has been typically featured on SmackDown, the belt would stay on come, come to raw with them. But We'll see how it all plays out. I mean, you know how I feel, though. If you listen to the show, WWE doesn't give a crap about the, the brand split. They don't care. Drew's been showing up on SmackDown. Solo and Jimmy show up on Raw whenever they want with nobody giving a damn. And they stay throughout the show and, and interfere in multiple matches, just like they did this past week. And no one gives a crap. So, which is, I mean, it's just insane. It's insanity. But... That means that they are allowed to just kind of do what they want. They have a brand split, kind of a soft one, and then they just, you know, they 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 let people come over on either brand and and do what they need to do from a creative standpoint and don't care. They they put all the brand rules aside. So, all right. Do you think Cody and Rock are in cahoots? It smells very suspicious, or as the kids would say, smells very sus. All right, I'm 40 years old, almost saying sus feels weird. I think something happens that puts Rock in that special ref spot, whether it's him flexing his power or it's in the contract that if Rock Roman and uh, Rock and Roman beat Cody and Seth on night one, Rock gets to referee. In the end, Rock refs. He doesn't help Cody win, but he stops Solo and Jimmy from inter- interfering, proving the, uh, that Roman can't beat Cody without the bloodline's help. This ends Cody's story, but starts Roman and Rock's. Sure. You know, uh, you know that that's that's actually cool. I mean, you know, I didn't think about what would be on the line in this projected tag team match that's very possible but as i've just said and i continue to say i don't need this match being overbooked overplayed too many people involved this should be a story about cody and roman and the injustice that cody suffered last year at wrestlemania due to solo sokoa that should be the story i understand the rock is back and you need to incorporate him somehow but i would If you're not going to have it just clean and 100% about Cody Roman, you need to at least mitigate the amount of booking and crazy returns and all these things that are going to distract from what could be a monumental title victory for Cody. So that's my problem. And that's my concern with uh, with this match is it's easily you could easily overbook this and the temptation to overbook it is immense. So we'll see how well they're able to to kind of uh, mitigate that that desire to uh, to completely overbook this match. All right, let's go to Omos. You love my spoiler, right? Well, I got my, I got it from a mate named Billy. P.S. My name is pronounced Omas. Ah, okay, there we go. Omas. 
I won't forget. All right. Uh, thanks, Omas. <laughs> so shout out to your your friend or mate, as you call him, uh, Billy. I guess if, since we're going to Australia, I'm just going to start pretending that I'm a, a, a native. Just call all my friends mates. Although, isn't that a British thing, too? I don't know. Is that British or is it just Australian when you call your friends mates? I'm not sure. All right. <laughs> Let's go. Let's see here. Um, let's get to <clears throat> Liam. Liam says, I have to get out my quick possible outcomes for the chamber that are not likely. I will show the percentage of it happening on the side. Okay, cool. Let's go. So you have LA Knight winning the chamber at 30%. I think that's actually a pretty fair. That's pretty fair. Maybe a little high, but I'd say 25. But I think LA Knight is a third pick. Yeah, that's that's cool. Uh, Naomi or Liv winning the chamber, 35%. I think that's really high, personally. Uh, I think Naomi is is definitely got a better chance than Liv, but right now the story isn't about Naomi or Liv. Naomi should get her chance. It'll probably be after WrestleMania. They'll put the spotlight more on her. But I think that even when you combine them, Naomi or Liv, combining their chances, I think it's like 10%, honestly. Alistair Black returns, 15%. Yeah, I didn't think about that. That's very possible. I'd say that's true. Nia Jax winning, <laughs> 0%. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No chance. Zero. Maybe, as I've said sometimes before, if you could do a negative chance, whatever that means, I would put negative chance of Nia Jax winning, yes. A match being made out of Grayson, the Grayson Waller effect. Cody versus Grayson. 40% and Grayson versus Seth 10%. Thank you for taking the time to read this email. I know it probably doesn't make it sense make it doesn't make sense as it is a bit rushed. Well, first of all, I need, I can't read number 1. Number 2, no, it makes perfect sense. Totally get what you're saying. Um I don't think you're going to see individual matches made out of it on the event where it'll take place, but sure, you can have Cody versus Grayson or Cody versus Theory who I think will be there or Seth versus Theory, any of those combinations. You could easily have them on Raw if Seth's ready to compete again or just have them team up. I mean, it could be Cody and Seth versus Grayson in theory on Raw. I mean, sure, uh, th- that absolutely could happen. The only other downside to this, because I got to look at the glass half empty because I'm a negative guy, is that uh, Seth Rollins continues to really um, put aside his own World Heavyweight Championship and continues to look at this He's looking at WrestleMania as like the Roman Reigns story. He has his own damn story. And I think as fans, we want to see him involved in his own story instead of constantly being involved in what's going on on SmackDown. I I understand why they do it because it's a bigger match. It just is. But hey, at some point, I want the World Heavyweight Championship to really feel important heading into WrestleMania as Seth continues to just be sidetracked with Cody and his story. But thanks, Liam. I think this might be the final email. Let's go. Uh, This is from Dennis. He says, hey, Matt, how are you? Just a quick short email. Now that it is obviously going to be the Uso brothers facing off at WrestleMania, who do you think will face Gunther? My pick is Sami Zayn because of all the interviews he's doing, saying he's going to be a champion in 2024. I think he will go after the IC title first and beat Gunther. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, Dennis, I think you're absolutely right. You know, now that it's not Jey Uso, which is sad, which saddens me. I think Jay deserves better at WrestleMania. <laughs> no disrespect to Jimmy, but Jimmy has been irrelevant for a long time now. It's Jay, and Jay was on fire, and the Yeet movement, all of that. But if it's not Jay, yes, Sami Zayn is a a nice substitute. He, from a character perspective, makes sense. He's on a losing streak. He's a lovable loser right now, but you know what he's capable of. You know, you, you if you rally behind him, he can win the big matches other than last year's chamber. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that is a safe assumption. And having Sami Zayn beat Gunther is, I I wouldn't hate it. I'm ready for Gunther to move on and move up, rather. So, thank you, Dennis. Okay, <laughs> that's how many emails I had, guys. That was just today. I mean, if you go back on Wednesday, there was a lot more, too. So that's why I, you know, that's why the, the time is, a, is always a, at a premium, here because there's so many but let's get to some of the voicemails i'll get through as many as i can so here we go 
What's going on, everybody? This is your guy, DJ Kuzo, back at it again on your mailbag show. Coming to you live once again, as always, on a Wednesday morning as we are heading into Elimination Chamber. And let's get to your favorite show to come on every single week on the mailbag. And I'm talking about the Veer, the Veer, the Veer, the Veer, the Veer Mahal Report. Now, the Veer Mahal Report took place this past Monday night on Monday Night Raw, live from Ein Anaheim, Anaheim, that's right, An Anaheim, 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 California. And once again, the end this year, a complete no show, no Veer Mahan, no Sangha, no modern day Maharaja. But I did see four days ago that none other than Jinder Mahal, the modern day Maharaja, was in Saudi Arabia alongside Braun Strowman, alongside Natalia and Chelsea Green. They were at the WWE Experience. I guess this is some sort of new, some sort of store mixed in with some sort of uh, video stuff that they're having over there. Edward Dye, Saudi Arabia, he was there connected with some of the fans that were down there in Saudi Arabia. But once again, where are they in this year? We're just a couple of days away from Elimination Chamber. We're still on the road to WrestleMania, and I am not giving up hope. I am not giving up hope that hopefully the end this year will make some sort of television appearance, whether it's a backstage segment. You know you hear me going on and on every single week about the end this year. You know the whole shtick. But I just wanted to say something that none other than Chelsea Green, she should have won that uh, Royal Rumble Battle Royal matchup to get into to get into the Elimination Chamber. She should have won that. No offense to Raquel Rodriguez. I'm a big fan of Chelsea Green. I love Chelsea Green. Justice for Chelsea Green. But back with the end this year. Let's see what happens next week. Let's see what happens on the road to WrestleMania. In the words of the great one, if you smell what the end this year is cooking. This is your guy, DJ Kuzmo. Enjoy Elimination Chamber if you're watching it live or you're watching it on a replay. Have a blessed week. Be kind to all of the stay see my friends, and peace. Wow. All right, DJ. Yeah, I don't know where the Inishir are. I don't know. They're MIA, man. I, I mean, I, I, you're, you're keeping us, you're keeping the Inishir alive. You are single-handedly keeping the Inishir in the minds of fans. The, the WWE should, should, you know, shake your hand. You are doing the Lord, Lord's work here for the Inishir keeping them at least in the minds of fans that they're at least not there. I don't know if they're at that, if they're at the experience or whatever weird store was open on. Yeah. I, I would imagine it's merch and you can cut your own promo kind of like a little WWE experience. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's something like that. Uh, you know, at least they're there doing that, but that doesn't really make me any comp doesn't have any, I don't have any confidence that it means they're going to show up on the show. I mean, I don't have any confidence anymore in WWE booking them at all. Until they show me otherwise. So I hope you enjoy Chamber there, buddy. Hope you enjoy Chamber. I know you'll be live on the Discord server for sure. And I appreciate it. Okay, let's keep on rolling. Hi, this is Joshua from Port Huron, Michigan. And I was listening to last Friday's episode of The Mailbag. And I'm on board 100% with Stone Cold showing up like you were discussing. When you said... We need some kind of inclination of any kind of reason of why he would care, why he would get involved. The one thing that came to my mind was he's been pretty vocal and it's well documented that he was angry about The Rock getting his match against Paul Hogan. And that's why he stepped away at one point. Maybe his whole angle could be you took the match from me, the dream match from me, make it your dream match. You're not going to do it again to this kid defending Cody. It's the only thing I could think of, but Austin's my favorite of all time, and I think that I would like that angle. So I figured I'd call and give you guys a message. Thank you. Hey, Josh, I really I appreciate it. I, you know, that is, that's that's something for sure. I mean, they, they could go that road, right? Like they could, um, you know, re remind us that the fact that The Rock faced Hogan and Austin didn't, but there was never any, at the time, it wasn't like we felt, or storyline-wise, that The Rock stepped ahead of, the, of Austin. Austin and Hogan is a bigger match. It just is. But it never happened because Austin actually didn't want it to happen. And that's been well-documented. He has been very vocal about the fact that he didn't want it to happen uh, because he was in a bad headspace. He didn't feel like Hogan would be able to have a good quality match. 
and and so on. If you listen to his reasoning, it, he's been very vocal over the last 20 years about why he didn't want it to happen at the time. The only thing I can think of uh, beyond that is perhaps Roman says something in passing. Perhaps Roman says something on SmackDown that's saying like, you know, uh, I'm going to be the greatest champion of all time. Uh, that that uh, the guys of the past, like Hulk Hogan, like Bret Hart, like Stone Cold Steve Austin, will bow at my feet. Right? He says something in passing, which triggers Austin. Austin does need a reason other than just, oh, I'm Austin, I can do anything. They've implemented that with Brock, and I, I hate that kind of creative. But it just it needs to be something loose because to me, this isn't setting up a program. It's just giving a reason for Austin to come out in a massive main event and clear the deck, evening the deck for, for Cody, not helping him defeat Roman, just taking away the others that are trying to cheat to win, right? Like solo and Jimmy. That's how I would do it is something, something slight against some kind of slight that Roman says in passing against Austin. That I think is all you need for having a reason for Austin to come out. So I think that's how it happens. But, uh, Thanks, Josh. Let's get to a couple more. Ask the French guy here, your current European champion. This is WrestleMania season, so any of you in Monday Night Raw, just like your French guy, can come up and defy me, try to take the European championship from me, even though you clearly know that you will never take it from me. I will be champion forever, just like Roman Reigns. Okay, guys, this week in wrestling, awesome. Raw, for one moment, was uh, for one week. It was pretty good, but uh, since The Rock came back, SmackDown was better, and uh, the segment with Heel Rock was Pure gold. That was exactly what we wanted to see from The Rock. What we wanted to see at the uh, at the beginning, of course, is Roman Reigns versus The Rock. But this version of The Rock, it is pure gold. And I think I hear you, Matt, and uh, from the weekend review, you asked uh, you and Anthony if The Rock should change the theme song, but he shouldn't because uh, nobody should come out with the bloodline because like it is a clear statement at the end of the speech that at the end of the promo that the rock is part of the bloodline right now and he's also said the the most powerful duo in professional wrestling i don't think it was planned i'm not sure but i think he he wanted to to say the faction or he, i don't know i don't think it was on purpose but uh, yeah the rock Finally, being full potential, and how can you boo The Rock for being such an awesome promo, such awesome genuine speech, which you don't, which you don't find uh, with Cody Rhodes and so on. So that's just a small comment. Thanks for bringing, thank the Cody Crybabies. Thank you for bringing us this version of The Rock. And uh, yeah. And also received a, a small note from the bloodline. Maybe your European champion will join the bloodline in, in a short notice. We'll see about that. Have a nice week, guys. Bye. All right, Alex. Please don't join the bloodline. Please. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. We we don't need another person. <laughs> we don't need any, we don't need anyone else muddying the water. But uh, I understand if you do. Right. Okay. Yeah, we, we can thank the Cody Crybabies for this. They are the reason that The Rock is as entertaining, even more entertaining than he would have been just as his standard babyface return character. And sure, this does mean that it's bumped, that Roman and Rock is bumped probably for a year, which is, you know, it's fine if they're going to do it right and all the fans are behind The Rock, which is what you want. You do want that. And this version of The Rock is going to allow people that hate The Rock to boo him. It's going to give a chance for people that support the rocks to, to laugh at what he says and, and, and just love his heel character of being trolled. And it also is going to take the fans that hate him and it's going to turn them into supporters because they are going to realize how talented the rock is and he's just entertaining. And I think it's going to turn, I, I would argue in a weird way, 
The Rock is more babyface when he's his heel character than he is when he's not. He feels more like an entertainer when he's a heel, even though the heel Rock trolls the fans, disparages the fans, acts like he's bigger than us. But we all know that he's just so good at that role. It's going to turn him into a massive baby face, even more so maybe than when he was just coming back as his standard, I'm the rock. You know, it. I think this is going to have a very positive effect for his character down the line. And it gives those people that don't like the rock a chance to boo him and get that out of our system so we can move on. But thank you, buddy. Now let's get to, boy, do I say one more? One more. Let's see what happens. What's well, everybody? I can see you here from Houston, Texas. I just want to get your thoughts, Matt, on a scenario I have. So everybody assumes that when Rock and Roman finally face off, it's going to be a heel Roman versus a baby face Rock. Why do we all think that? My question to you or my scenario is, which I think might be better, Roman loses the belt sometime this year in 2024. And that has The Rock questioning whether Roman still has it or not. In turn, starts to try to get the bloodline to turn on the, on Roman, which starts to turn Roman and babyface. Then, so this will keep The Rock in heel, in heel character for, for the remainder of his run, essentially. Because I think it's vital that if you have uh, heel Roman face off against a baby face rock, you're gonna have interference with Roman going over, and that's not really going to establish him as head of the table if he needs help to beat the rock. But if you have the rock essentially having the bloodline trying to turn on Roman, and then have uh, Roman start to turn baby face, and when they finally face off, you have a baby face Roman defeats a heel rock clean, which is the way it needs to happen, clean. It needs to happen clean for Roman to truly be head of the table because I don't think it does any favors for Rock to win and be named head of the table if he's not sticking around after this run. So I hope I laid that out clearly enough for you to understand my premise. I wanted to get your thoughts. Because, like you said, we are going to get a baby face bloodline eventually. But, like I said, you could have The Rock try to take over, which starts to turn Roman. He takes time off after losing the belt. The Rock stays around as the quote-unquote head of the table. But when the true head of the table returns, full-on baby face, I think you have to defeat Rock that way. So, just give me your thoughts. Everybody, I enjoy listening to y'all every week. I know I haven't been on as much. but Life has really taken over for me, but again, I'm still enjoying everybody. And don't forget, March 12th, after Raw, the Raw Review, you will hear the debut of Mrs. Rocky T along with myself and Matt on the Raw Review. All right, everybody, don't have a good day. Have a great day. All right, uh, I didn't catch your name at the beginning, so I apologize. Um, okay, so I like this. It's inter- it's, it's certainly aggressive in the fact that you would actually turn this match, this mega match, when it happens, on its head. Where you'd get it, but it would be flipped in rolls. It's interesting. It's doable. But here's the question. Do the fans want that? Because The Rock right now is so entertaining as a heel. It's, it's. I don't know if the fans ever truly will hate The Rock. Meaning, true heel heat. You know, like what Dominic Mysterio gets or what Randy Orton got in his feud with Edge a few years ago. <clears throat> you know, there are moments of true heel heat. The Rock's so entertaining. I don't know if they'll boo The Rock. So he may, you may not, they may be trying to swim upstream if they try to do this. Uh, I know what you're saying that The Rock, you know, Roman comes back after the bloodline turns on him because Rock is trying to take his, you know, take, take over. The bloodline turn on Roman. Roman goes away. He tries to come back. But the, the the dream match, don't forget, the original dream match, which is still, I think, the best version of this match, is a babyface rock versus a heel Roman. Now, sure, the head of the table would be on the line, whatever the hell that means, by the way. Like, what does that exactly mean? Who's the alpha male of their family? I mean, what does this mean? Like, what is on the line exactly other than just a, a, t- a meaningless title? Uh, when I say title, I mean 
I don't mean a physical belt. You know, like The Rock and Roman could have more ma- more than one match, by the way. Which, if that happens, you could have The Rock beat Roman the first time, and then Roman beat Rock the second time. Let me look what they did with John Cena and The Rock from WrestleMania twenty six or twenty six to twenty seven or twenty seven to twenty eight. I never can remember. Uh, but The Rock won the first one, and then returned the favor of the following WrestleMania, dropping the belt to John Cena. So you could have a scenario like that with The Rock beating Roman and then Roman beating The Rock. You could absolutely have that happen. I mean, I wouldn't mind more than one match with these two, but the first encounter needs to be the one that we all clamored for before the belt got involved and the We Want Cody thing happened. Remember the reaction from fans when the when Rock said just a month ago, month and a half ago, what if I sit at the head of the table? The crowd lost it. That's the version of The Rock that eventually we want to see versus Roman. And again, I know The Rock is going to go back to Hollywood. It should be about Roman getting the victory. But you do that after The Rock's already gotten his big one against Roman Reigns. So again, I think it could be a multi-match program. Probably not more than two matches. That would probably be the the max with The Rock and and Roman. But that is, I mean, if you try to do a heel Rock as it is currently, I think the fans will still cheer him. Because he's so entertaining. You could argue The Rock isn't really even heel because the, the fans, even when he comes out, you hear his music, the fans pop massively. Um, and The Rock is so entertaining with what he says and how he looks and just the appreciation fans have for him that it lends itself to cheers rather than boos. So you can have this version of The Rock face Roman and try to turn Roman babyface, but I don't think that's going to work as successfully as it will with the traditional mega match that we've wanted for nine years now of rock baby face, Roman heel. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we need to try to flip the script here just because Cody Rhodes uh, was bumped from the main event only to have the fans bring him back. That was a specific Cody Rhodes and, and champion undisputed championship situation. The fans didn't turn on the rock because he's the rock and there was something wrong with the rock. They turned on him because of the perception that Cody was stepping aside for The Rock when Cody had a much more intriguing story going on. So now when you remove the title and Cody and Roman's over, I think fans will be back to supporting The Rock because that was the whole reason they turned on him. They didn't turn on him just because, right? So, um, but your way is not impossible. It's possible, but it's risky. It's risky, you know, and, and, and I just... I want to be able to cheer The Rock, and I think most fans feel this way. I, we all want to be able to say, you know, uh, the Roman Reigns is the heel, Rock is babyface. You want to be able to cheer The Rock in the match because that's what we've wanted from day one. But in two matches, you could you could mess with the second match and try the the way that you're you're proposing. But we'll see. <sighs> I take a breath because I think that's it. Now, everybody, if you want to join us for the uh, the, the whole event over the next 24 hours, you can do that at patreon.com slash WWE podcast with an ad free experience. And I'd also like to welcome Brandon who has joined us over on the Patreon side of things. And Sam, I think Sam Vasquez, I think I already gave you a shout out, but I gave you another one. Um, so thank you to the new patrons as you guys have joined uh, a few of us, a few of you have joined us over the last few days. We have uh, a lot of, going on as we are going to cover Elimination Chamber from wall to wall. I'll give you my uh, reaction to it probably, again, probably Sunday. I'll try to do Saturday night, but as I've told you, I have some events going on that may prevent that. We will see. Uh, We'll see, but I will uh, definitely try to give you my reaction by Sunday in the weekend review, and which will really just be an Elimination Chamber review. So uh, join us on ad free. If you don't want to listen to all the ads you've heard throughout the show today, you can go to Patreon. That's a good place. Or Apple Podcasts offers an ad free experience as well with both of them offering free trials. So if you want actually everything free, like you don't want to deal with the ads, but you don't want to pay, there are free trials available. So for both of them. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I appreciate it. I will be back with you in a, a day, a couple days. And uh, until then, enjoy the chamber, everybody. Take care. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to wwepodcast.com.
And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time. 